Welcome to the webinar. And um, I'm going to ask you to let us know where you are logging in from so that it gives us a geographic view of where we are communicating with you. Um, and let me introduce myself. I'm Ayanda Lebele. I serve as the director at the International University, at the Botswana International University of Science and Technology. I am here also in my capacity as the vice chair of the IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Division, and I uh, will be uh, facilitating uh, the discussions in the webinar. I'll be co-driving with my colleagues. We would continue introducing themselves as we go on. First and foremost, let me start by introducing, let me give uh, the chair a moment to welcome you. And then I will then introduce my speakers, my good speakers, and then we'll proceed from there. Over to you, uh, Dr. Kadu. Um, thank you so much, um, our moderator. Uh, good day, colleagues. We are happy to, to have you here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation. We welcome you all who have managed to connect to this call to participate in the webinar organized by the IFLA Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Division Committee. And in a special way, we welcome our facilitators and thanking you for accepting to be with us today at this time. We are aware that there are lots of competing priorities, but you choosing to be here means a lot to us. Please keep coming whenever we invite you. Today, we are actually looking at advocacy with special reference to WIPO. We have come here to remind ourselves about copyright issues and how we can meaningfully engage in WIPO and organize the events. As you have already noted, we are connecting on the call from different geographical locations. Therefore, we need to acquire knowledge and skills, which will assist us in engaging meaningfully with the people who matter within these countries we represent in order to push for rights that matter to the libraries and the library sector in general, so that we are not left behind. Without further ado, I wish every participant meaningful engagement. Thank you so much for your attention and back to you, the moderator. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Kadu. And um, this, at this point, I would introduce my speakers and they are in this order. I will, we will have at first Teresa Hackett. She will be handling the focus area on introduction to WIPO. And then we would have Dick Koya, who will engage in WIPO, we would, would talk on how to engage in, in WIPO activities and initiatives. And then our very own Stephen would then give us a guide on developing a, dry, a draft to engage in WIPO. At this stage, let me start by introducing I choose to start with uh, Dr. Dick Kuya. Um, you would see why as we progress. Uh, Dick holds a PhD in communications and information from the University of Tennessee, where his doctoral research explored Ugandan traditional musicians and their IP ownership. Uh, Dick Kuya coordinates advocacy in Africa for the project contributing to public interest copyright policy at WIPO, promoting access to knowledge and the right to research. Interestingly, he works very closely with the IFL, uh, EIFL, IFL, Copyright and Libraries Program Manager, Teresa Hackett. So this is why I chose to start with him so that I make reference to our other speaker, Teresa Hackett who indeed is one of our speakers and um, we are really a good team. And Dick is an associate professor at the School of Information Science, the E-School, University of Carolina. 
He has 18 years experience of research, teaching and advocacy in the field of intellectual property. His full bio, his full bio is in the call for registration and is on the website. I really encourage you to visit it so that you pick his areas of interest and you see how you can further develop yourself and support him. But I may just add that Dick has been involved in several major international projects. He has led researcher for the African Copyright and Access to Knowledge, ACA2K, the project of 2006 to 2010. And he participated in the Open Air, the African Innovative Research Training Project. He was in IFL's, he was IFL's first national copyright expert in, the, in Uganda, representing the consortium of Ugandan libraries. As I said, it is more about him, but I really want to highlight that he's not just co-preenting with Teresa here, they have worked together, so they've always been a team. He has consulted in the World Intellectual Property uh, WIPO. He has also been part of the Marrakesh Treaty for Persons with Disabilities. And he has participated in consultative meetings with the African Union. So he is our advocate in so many ways. I think I would pause there and talk about Teresa, who has been very helpful in the growth and development um, of Dick's journey. Our dear Teresa Hackett, she is, a she is a copyright and libraries program manager at IFL, Electronic Information for Libraries, an NGO that works with libraries in over 50 developing and transitioning economy countries to enable access to knowledge. I actually have uh, uh, to openly thank you, Teresa, for the privilege that you support our countries and my institution has always been a beneficiary. My country has been a beneficiary of your works. And um, we all are waiting to be working with you, not just Dick. So Teresa, uh, we, we are really appreciative. Teresa has worked for 20 years in the area of public interest, copyright law reforms. She supports a network of specialist copyright librarians and many of whom have done well in improving national copyright laws in their countries. She has contributed for over 20 nations joining WIPO, the WIPO's Marrakesh Treaty for Persons with Print Disabilities. That indeed was one of the great success stories for libraries. So thanks for that also, Teresa. Actually, in 2015, Teresa was recognized by the Subtle Worth Foundation as an agent for social change. So she is the change we want to see. In 2018, she also received the IFLA Medal of Distinguished Contribution to International Librarianship in the field of copyright. I also invite you to view her profile online and to contact her privately for whatever support because she is available and she will support us. I reserve that one for Stephen. I will get it when he, uh, because he's one of us, when he takes the podium, we will then say his bit. Um, ladies and gentlemen, having introduced our speakers, allow me to hand over to my co, uh, my colleague, Damilari, to guide on um, how we are going to be getting into the different groups so that we follow our, um, our presenters. Thank you and over to you, Damilari. To everyone and good afternoon. Nice to join you here virtually again. My name is Damilari. I'll be walking us through uh, the structure of the webinar today. So uh, I believe you can see my screen. So yeah, so what are we doing today now? What is the structure of today's webinar? We're trying to analyze a more practical approach to come up with major outcomes that we can harness in the various countries to drive progress on library matters in related to WIPO. And um, so we, we, the focus of this webinar, as I mentioned, is to raise awareness to librarians in Southern Africa on about WIPO and how to engage, and secondly, to support librarians in Southern Africa to develop in-country plans for WIPO engagements. And lastly, is to co-create a community of librarians uh, who will draft an advocacy engagement plan to engage and push for library agenda on wireful related matters. And this week, we're going to have speaking sessions today, uh, which we're going to speak about introduction to WIPO, then the engage, how to engage in WIPO, and 
and a plan to engage in white work. However, as you progress on that, you'll be grouped into breakout rooms uh, where you work together to uh, develop a plan draft to engage in WIPO in your various regions. And from there, uh, you're going to select a group leader in your group that will present the plan you've developed. And afterwards, uh, we take comment from the speakers after you develop a plan and share with us. And then uh, we'll have action steps and, and, and next points to work on, on that. Uh, as earlier said by, by my co facilitator, the focus of this is to be sure that we're able to have uh, a clear plan afterwards to engage in country. Uh, with WIPO and see how we can drive progress for libraries as on this particular engagement. So that'll be all I have to share with you now on how the structure of this engagement would go. I think this breakout room session comes up for the speakers uh finish speaking. I'm gonna hand over to to Dr. Ian. Over to you, Dr. Thank you, Damilari. Uh, colleagues, I believe you have picked on how we are going to be um, way, progressing as the program. And at this point, I'm going to start with uh, Teresa giving us a briefing, a presentation. Right. Would you like me to start now? Yes, I believe so. Is that so, right. Damilari? Yes, of course. There is okay. over to you. So thank you very much, uh, you know, for the invitation to, to speak at this webinar. I think it's a really uh, great initiative. And uh, thank you for the kind uh, introductions to, to myself and to Dick. And as you mentioned, um, you know, Dick and I have been working together for many years, so we're, we're old friends and comrades uh, in this particular, you know, this particular area. And I think it's really great to see the, the division taking the initiative to, to, to learn about WIPO and what happens there, and then to start to develop plans so that you know, the, the current generation of librarians and the next generation of librarians are informed and well-placed to, to play their part in these really important global activities in which the region of Africa is playing a particularly has a particularly significant role and we'll come to that in a moment so i'm going to uh share my screen and put up some slides here so before i go any further can i just check that you can see my screen yes we can you can okay thank you very much so i'm going to give a very brief introduction on WIPO um, and what, it, what, what WIPO is, how does it work? But before I started, since I am the first speaker today, I wanted to say briefly why libraries are involved in WIPO. So uh, basically it's very simple. WIPO sets global copyright rules and policy, including international treaties on copyright and related issues. And in particular, one of WIPO's main committees, which is called the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, or SCCR for short, is the main forum where discussions are held on global copyright issues. Then on the other hand, libraries depend on copyright limitations and exceptions for many of their core activities like for example making supporting researchers by making research copies uh, providing information services to people with print disabilities with, with disabilities including print disabilities where you may need to make a copy of a work in an accessible format for that person and also preserving our cultural heritage which involves making copies of the material that you want to preserve so many of our activities depend on these provisions in the copyright law, which are known as limitations and exceptions on the exclusive rights. So this means that libraries are key stakeholders in copyright debates, and especially when copyright laws are being updated or being reformed. It's really important that libraries are at the table and that they are able to contribute to the debates and to say what 
the what provisions the law should have or what libraries need in the law to make the law work for libraries. It doesn't mean that librarians all have to be copyright lawyers, although if you are, that certainly helps. And there are many people who have both roles. They have a library hat and a copyright lawyer hat. But I think what it does mean is that you can, you, you are able to, you know who your policy makers are, you can engage with the policy makers and that you can explain to them in library terms what what libraries do so that they understand what libraries do so that then they can craft the law to make the law work for libraries. And I think in these copyright debates, um, libraries have a really unique role and a special role because we represent the public interest. We represent, uh, we are representing the libraries whose mission is to enable access to knowledge for education and research and development and lifelong learning. And all of those other, uh, you know, great activities that libraries do across all all library types: public libraries, academic libraries, special libraries, research libraries, and national libraries. And in in my experience, the policy makers really appreciate when librarians uh, engage with them on these issues because we are helping them to uh, to craft laws that work for people and institutions like libraries. Now Dick will talk further about engaging specifically uh, in, in copyright issues, but I think you know to have that over, overview picture is quite uh, is quite good to start with. Um, so one of the reasons why we are engaged at WIPO is because of the fact that many copyright laws in many uh, uh, countries fall short. So they don't meet current library needs, especially in the digital environment. So for example, we know that only about 30% of countries allow copying for digital preservation. But yet the internet is global and yet copyright exceptions stop at the border. So sometimes there are problems with cross-border activities. So there are many activities now that libraries are engaged in, particularly in the digital cross-border environment where the laws are not up to date and they haven't kept up with with library needs. So what is WIPO? Uh, WIPO stands for the World Intellectual Property Organization. WIPO is an intergovernmental organization, so that means it's comprised of member states and it is part of the UN family, so it's a specialized agency of the United Nations, it's like a technical agency but part of the UN family. And I think that's important because then, you know, WIPO then as part of the UN um, will have, uh, you know, will have a responsibility towards, um, towards societal issues like, uh, uh, you know, such as development agenda issues. Um, WIPO is headquartered in Geneva and there are external offices around the world, including two offices in Africa. So one in Algeria and one in Nigeria. The Director General is uh, Mr. Darren Tang from Singapore, and there are currently 193 member states. So it's safe to say that all of your countries are members of WIPO. And WIPO is, uh, is a global forum, so this international organization that provides a whole range of services around intellectual property. So that's copyright, patents, trademarks, and industrial property. So they provide policy and legislative advice, information and cooperation. And they really shape the international copyright rules. They provide services uh, to governments, so that could be technical advice, training, capacity building. And they also have um, a lot of very useful information. So for example, one of the sources that we use uh, quite regularly is WIPOLEC, which is uh, a compilation of the national laws, including copyright laws of all countries. So that, it would be your one, your, your first port of call if you're looking to identify a copyright law in a particular country, check WIPOLEX um, and see, see what, what, what's there. Um, so WIPO administers international IP treaties, including copyright treaties. And I've listed here a couple of the main treaties that are important for libraries. So the Berne Convention from 1886, the WIPO Internet Treaties from 1996, and most recently, the Marrakesh Treaty for Persons with Print Disabilities that was adopted in 2013. So, and not only does WIPO administer 
international treaties. It negotiates these international treaties. And as was mentioned earlier um, in the Marrakesh Treaty, many of us here were involved in those negotiations to negotiate the Marrakesh Treaty, the persons with print disability. And that treaty, the Marrakesh Treaty and the WIPO Internet Treaties were negotiated in this committee, the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. The committee is comprised of member states. So you've got, uh, you've got delegates representing the government. And within the government delegates, you've got two, two uh, cohorts. So you have the Geneva-based delegates, and then you have the capital-based officials. So every country will have its mission in Geneva, and there will be a diplomat in that mission who, has, who, who is following the WIPO file. Um, the diplomats are from, will be from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then you have the capital-based officials who may come to Geneva for these particular meetings. So you'll have people from your copyright office, your national copyright office, your IP office, who come uh, to Geneva to support the, the, uh, the Geneva-based diplomat. So in that case, you'll have the, you know, they may have, they have technical expertise. So the technical experts will come from the capital. Now, not every, every country will send a person from capital to every meeting. Um, it sort of depends maybe on the meeting from time to time. In addition at the meeting, we have organizations like IFLA, like IFO, who are uh, Education International, who are known as observers. So that means we're not member states, but we can attend the meetings and we can attend the meetings as observers. Now, although we are technically called observers, it doesn't mean we can only observe. We can participate in the meetings as well. So we have an opportunity to give statements during the meetings. And of course, we can talk to the delegates during the meetings as well. Now, the SCCR usually meets twice a year. And the next meeting will be in March 2023, 13th to the 17th of March. So when you're doing uh, uh, looking at your advocacy plans later on in the session, I think it's good to keep this in mind because this is a concrete date that will be happening and a concrete, uh, you know, a, a, an opportunity to, to engage for that meeting. The member states are organized into different regional groups. Um, the African group is the largest group geographically, um, simply because of the number of countries there. And um, so the African group is a very important group at WIPO, and it's a very important group that if any the decisions are being made or any, um, you know, any initiatives are being taken that the African group is part of that consensus and, and in many areas takes the lead in bringing initiatives and proposals. Um, and, and right now in the area of limitations and exceptions and libraries, I would say that the African group is, is certainly showing, uh, is showing great leadership at WIPO. So your representatives, um, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are from uh, they're from the some of them are from the Geneva-based missions, and some of them are from capital. So in this picture here, we see the delegate from Nigeria is from the uh, Geneva so from Algeria is from the, the mission. The delegates from Nigeria are from the, the, the capital. Um, you can check who your representatives are uh, using the participant list from any of the SCCRs. So the most recent SCCR was in uh, May of this year. So you can check who registered to attend that meeting. And now that the meetings at the SCCR are hybrid, so since the COVID, uh, since COVID, it's possible to register in hybrid mode to participate remotely. So there you can see a list of all the delegates who registered. So that's a handy way to start identifying who your uh, particular delegates are. So what's on the agenda at WIPO? Well, libraries are on the agenda, which is really great. Also education and research. So coming up at this meeting uh, in March next year, there's three particular issues that are relevant. Will there be, uh, there's preservation by cultural heritage institutions, including libraries, where we expect the secretariat to present a toolkit on preservation that they have been preparing. There will be an expert session on the cross-border uses of copyright protected material. And there will be, uh, a, there will present a scoping study on research exceptions, including text and data mining. So 
there's there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of areas going on, and I'm sure your delegates would really welcome your engagement before the meeting. It helps them to prepare their positions and helps them when they're uh, making their own statements in the plenary sessions at the SCCR. So how to get involved? Um, I'm going to now hand over to my colleague Dick, who will uh, take you on the next step. So thanks very much, and I will stop sharing. Over to you, Thank Dick. you so much. Over to you, Dick. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, very much. So. Okay, and can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Reporting for e duty. <laughs> e excellent. Um, I apologize if you hear any noise in the background. I have a, a storm going through my area early morning storm, so I, I apologize for any background noise. I uh, echo my friend and long-term colleague, uh, Teresa, in thanking the organizers of this meeting for the invitation uh, to be part of this meeting, and especially my friend and long-term colleague, Dr. Sarah Kadu from Uganda. Um, if you're wondering where the name is, um, um, it's from Uganda originally, uh, but now based in the U.S., uh, where I currently serve as an associate professor in the School of Information Science at the University of South Carolina. As uh, the moderator mentioned, uh, I've worked in this area for a long time. I certainly worked with my colleague, uh, uh, Teresa Hackett, uh, who I like to think is probably uh, part of the African uh, information profession uh, ecosystem, given the length of her engagement in um, uh, a wide range of issues involving uh, librarianship and information in Africa. I will not spend a lot of time doing introductions since those were done, um, but I would like to acknowledge uh, the folks that are supporting much of the work we are doing. I feel was mentioned. Um, at, at the moment, we have supported by the Acadia Charitable Trust uh, through the American University um, uh, Washington College of Law. Uh, so the much of the work we are doing at WIPO and in many parts in Africa is currently supported by these funding agencies. And I cannot forget my institution, the University of South Carolina, uh, the College of Information and Communication, uh, where I'm a faculty member. So very quickly, um, how can you engage in WIPO activities? Um, I've had the distinct uh, opportunity of being involved in WIPO activities uh, since 2005, when uh, my colleague Teresa invited me to be part of the Eiffel delegation. Um, at, the at the time, WIPO was looking at development dimension of intellectual property and, and copyright uh, as part of that uh, ecosystem. So much uh, has changed since then, and certainly much has uh, uh, happened to help focus on issues affect, affecting developing uh, countries and developing regions uh, like Africa. But um, uh, it, that uh, depends so much on our engagement and involvement in, in these activities. So over the years, we've had librarians come to speak and be part of uh, different activities at WIPO. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to see so many young folks uh, on this call, uh, which means that uh, we are going to, we can ensure that there's the next generation of uh, copyright experts and, and advocates that are going to take this work forward when folks like me and Teresa Hackett retire <laughs> in a few years. Uh, so there are mainly two ways, um, or three ways, and I will spoke up, speak about the third in a moment, uh, two ways in which you can uh, engage in WIPO. Uh, first and foremost, directly through WIPO processes and activities. Here, uh, WIPO is a complex organization. It is a large organization. Um, copyright is one of several areas uh, administered by WIPO. Uh, so as you can imagine, there are so many uh, structures and processes within the organization 
both based in Geneva, but also across different parts of the world. Um, but primarily, we have been engaged in the work of committees. Uh, Teresa mentioned the SCCR. Uh, that is the primary um, venue for discussing copyright issues. It's under the Copyright Division. And that's where much of the work for libraries is implicated. However, there are other committees which are important to a region like Africa, uh, the Committee on Development and Intellectual Property, CDIP. A number of uh, projects are on IP in Africa have been supported through this committee. And many of them may, may involve libraries, but certainly they impact national intellectual property uh, policies and strategies and implementations of those strategies, uh, which in turn impacts uh, what we do as librarians and information professionals. Uh, then there's the Committee on Intellectual Property uh, Protection for Traditional Knowledge and Traditional Culture Expressions. This is very important for Africa. Uh, as you know, many librarians um, in Africa, uh, traditional knowledge and traditional knowledge systems are critical to whether or not we are able to preserve our culture, our languages, and a, a host of expressive forms. So the work of this committee um, is very important. Libraries are not directly implicated, but as you hear probably in the next few years, uh, much of what this committee does is going to have important implications for the work of libraries as cultural institutions, uh, certainly as institutions involved in the preservation of uh, cultural heritage. Uh, beyond the committees, uh, we have the General Assembly, uh, assemblies, uh, which usually happens once a year. That's where all committees within the, with the organization, WIPO, uh, reports and the, the General Assembly takes actions on, or, um, on recommendations from the committee. So it's again very important that we are involved at that level because uh, that's when uh, ultimately decisions are made by, by the member states. So how do we engage in committee work or General Assembly? As uh, Teresa mentioned, um, the primary vehicle is through working with organizations that have what we call observer status. So over the years, I've been white WIPO um, as a representative or part of delegation of IFLA or IFO and a few other observer organizations. So we have these two organizations as librarians that can help us to be involved in the activities of these organizations. Sometimes I work directly as a WIPO expert. I've served in that capacity on um, non-copyright issues in areas of you know, patents and, 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 and other areas, mostly as an expert on projects uh, commissioned under the CDIP. So that is another avenue. Uh, but um, the second way we can engage in WIPO activities is by following national processes. Uh, so this is important because uh, WIPO does not exist in a vacuum. The work that is done at WIPO uh, does not exist in the vacuum. Much of that reflects national priorities and activities, hence the need for us to be also involved in national activities. Here, we can be involved in two ways. Uh, first, by engaging with um, Geneva-based delegations. So most countries have foreign missions um, in Geneva, uh, mostly represented through Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, uh, and therefore part of uh, uh, you know, uh, your country's missions to, to the UN system. So that is an important way to engage in national activities, although these folks are based in Geneva. Then you also have national delegations, uh, which often originate from uh, the capitals or the countries. Uh, so Minister of Culture Affairs, uh, copyright administrators, and other uh, government agencies tend to be involved in different copyright issues. 
uh, including you know communications ministers of, of communications or agencies involved in communication regulation of communication activities so these are sort of the main two ways in which you can engage in wipo activities uh, but beyond the um beyond the the national and the geneva or international activities we also have regional activities um, and agencies here, I like to highlight two, um, Aripo, which is based in Zimbabwe, and OAPI, which is, represents the Francophone organization. These regional organizations help to regulate uh, IP and copyright activities in these two countries, in these, these two regions. And then most recently, we have the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area Protocol, which is under the auspices of the African Union, uh, part of this um, um, uh, entity is intellectual property, is the intellectual property protocol. That is currently under negotiations, negotiation. Um, and the main um, government agency that are taking a lead in your countries will likely be Minister of Trade, but also uh, IP um, regulators uh, in, the, in those different countries. So it's very important that we are engaged in the activities of these uh, regional organizations. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are others in other sectors, be it agriculture or trade, but these are primarily the main organizations that we need to pay attention to and be involved in their activities. So um, briefly, those are the two ways in which we can be involved. But I like to come back to this issue of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, using uh, our professional practice because, as Teresa mentioned, why libraries? Uh, it is important because, uh, as librarians, uh, much of what we do is regulated by copyright and other areas of intellectual property. So, uh, but oftentimes uh, librarians are not involved in policy making. We are not engaged. Yet the work we do and the institutions we represent are implicated in policy making. So for me, part of what I've done over the years is to make sure that uh, I am the research I'm engaged in uh, uh, impacts uh, policy and likewise policy impacts is reflected in the research I do. So when you think about your professional practice as librarians in Africa, whether you are doing cataloging, whether you're do, doing reference, whatever you do has implications for policy and legislation. And it's very important that you bring that to bear uh, when you talk about national or international uh, policy making and, the, uh, and legislation. So with that, I would like to um, uh, invite any questions and probably hand over to Stephen or the moderator, I don't know who, uh, but yes, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and thank you again for inviting us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dick. Oh, that's, that's quite a lot. And thank you to you too, Teresa. At this point, colleagues, I would invite Stephen, but before I invite Stephen, let me remind you that the Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Division, we have a mandate to advocate for libraries and to build capacity. So this is a session where we are bringing in experts to kind of open a door so that we see how and where we can continue our advocacy. So it is a capacity building initiative by the division and particularly noting that WIPO is a global forum from the earlier presenters. We know that there are a global forum that we can collaborate with in issues of international copyrights law. So let's find our national copyrights offices and let's link with that, with them. Having talked about our role in advocacy, now I would introduce uh, Stephen. Steven is, uh, he's at IFLA headquarters. He is the manager, policy and advocacy at IFLA. So he is 
Uh, Stephen, allow me to say that you are our boss, eh? <laughs> so he's, he's really supportive in helping us build capacity on issues of advocacy. He's a policy advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, where he leads on efforts to build understanding of the role of libraries and influence policy making, the very point that Dick ended the at. So without getting more into uh, Stephen's uh, profile, which I know is a whole Bible, let me hand over to, to you, Stephen, and uh, you, 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 over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Great. Yes, Steve. Thank you so much. And, 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 and to be honest, I don't know, the way we like to see things is that, is that you're our boss. So, I don't know, we, we are an organisation that's built on our members, it's built around our volunteers, and so our function really is to try and do what's helpful, what's useful. So, um, I, I, I Anders introduced me far more flatteringly than I would have done myself, um, so I, I will get into it, but I guess what I want to do, I'm the bridge between the presentations, all of the context, the really valuable context that Theresa and Dick have set out, and, and I'm grateful for that because it's also, it's actually always helpful for me to hear those arguments and hear those realities set out so clearly, so succinctly in such a good structured way. So I, I'm grateful for that. Um, my function is to sort of get us from that towards you going into breakout groups, which will be the next types, next part of this, this the, the, the time we've got together, and thinking about well, what is your plan? What are the things that you actually do on the ground? I don't know, how can you get going on this? Um, Dick's already alluded to some of this, so I do risk repeating one or two things. So I'm really sorry, I'm doing this from outside because it's the quietest place I could find. So I'm also dealing with sort of about four degrees and slightly suffering in it. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. So um, as I said, so I want to talk a little bit about developing that WIPO engagement plan. Um, I said, just as a little bit of I think you've heard about this. Many of you will be aware of IFLA as an organization. We're there at the global level, working with all types of libraries, with members in about 135 countries. Our function is both to, to engage directly, but I think a really important thing is it's providing the space, the forum where people can actually talk, where I think some of those things that Dick was talking about, that you, our experiences, what we're living, I don't know, the war stories we have, the challenges we have, it's a space to talk about this work out what we have in common, work out where actually we need to push for action, and then making sure that we do get the laws and the support to provide these. And it's a point I know I, I like underlining. I'm conscious, I'm very aware that copyright and WIPO often look like they are quite abstract, there's not an immediate financial payoff, they're conflictual, they're complex, they're technical, etc. But I think actually it's a really important thing to remember for libraries getting the right copyright laws should be as important as funding because we could have the most amazing budget and we could acquire all of the content we want but if we then have copyright laws that completely tie our hands as to how we can use it what's the point in spending the money I know, a permissive copyright law a modern copyright law a flexible copyright law is really essential if we want to maximize the value of our collections, if we want to maximize our impact, especially in a world that's got used to this, had, had to get used to COVID, especially in a world where we want to be inclusive, especially in a world where digital is the norm in reality, even if it's not yet in law. Um, so I suppose I, I just wanted to, because I, I think it, it's kind of important when we're thinking about what we want to do with this advocacy plan, I, I Five minutes before I was welcomed to, to the floor by and I thought, hmm, we really need to work out what it is that we're asking for. So I've slightly thrown this down. Um, fortunately, Theresa and Dick have, have turned off their cameras, so I can't see the horrified expressions on their faces right now that I've just put this down there. But I think that I know, it's always important that we have a starting point and we need to know what we're going for. And I think I suppose we can split this into two levels. What we're trying to do throughout our work in WIPO at a very high level, it's overcoming the idea that copyright is only about rights holders. It's overcoming the idea that the job of WIPO is to protect rights holders. And 
it's it's a challenge. Um, WIPO is, is is logically enough gets risks being captured by right holders. WIPO certainly in the trademark and the patent patenting space, um, have an interest in there being more registrations. They have an interest in people pursuing intellectual property because they make money from it. And that's a perfectly natural thing to do. That's fine. It isn't the case in copyright, but there is always a risk that people see the int uh, that in, in WIPO and elsewhere, they see the right holder interest as being the same thing as the general interest, the public interest, which we know isn't true. Copyright is about balancing interests. It's balancing the interests of rights holders with the interests of the public. We need to stop believing that the rights holders interest is the public interest, that they're one and the same thing. We need the importance of education, research and access, access to culture to be taken seriously. Getting slightly more practical, um, and but in more general terms, firstly, we need to be very cautious about any effort to extend rights or create new rights, um, or even any effort to promote enforcement, that these aren't done in ways that actually limits those possibilities, those rights to education, culture and research. And we also need, following the model of the Marrakesh Treaty, to see, to get an understanding that international instruments that mandate exceptions and limitations, a, a minimum that allow, that give that legal clarity, that certainty that you can work across borders, that's a valuable thing. That is a valid thing for WIPO to be working on. Those are the high level asks. Far more specifically, in the very short term, and, and we'll, we can share more information about this, there are proposals on the table from the African group even, so <laughs> this is home territory for you. Um, and they've been very quite active in, in calling for some really good practical steps forward that make sure that we're getting the evidence that matters, we're, I know, we're really building up the case for something that helps libraries, so moving that work forward. And I think in general, trying to make sure that the, the WIPO Secretariat, through its work with the committee, but also outside of it, is actually focusing seriously on how can we make sure that preservation, that every country has a good preservation statute that works across borders, every country has good research statutes that work across borders, that we're allowing for digital education, cross-border education as well. So those are some slightly more specific asks. So those are the asks. Do screenshot this page. Um, so I might allow you a couple of seconds to do that because that's going to be a reference going forward. Next slide. A couple of quick words about advocacy, just as a, a, a sort of prelude to what I'm going to say next. Um, I know we talk a lot about advocacy, and in particular, as I said, in the context of, of copy or copyright, people tend to steer away from copyright advocacy. There are plenty of really strong, powerful advocates for libraries who've just decided they're not going to do copyright. Um, sometimes because they think it's just about lobbying. It's just about being chummy with the minister, about corruption, about slightly sinister things like knowing the minister's children's names and things like that. And that's not true. Advocacy is a whole range of activities and skills, everything from communication to lobbying. And we're not denying that lobbying is important. We need to have champions in government. We need to have people who are our friends, who will work with us, who will get libraries and get libraries interests into the discussion. But there's a whole range of skills, a whole range of activities needed. And, and that means that actually can really be, second point, it's a team sport. This isn't something that one person has to do on their own. It can really be done by a group of people who bring their respective skills, their respective talents together. Finally, it's possible. I think, as Teresa has said, and Teresa's list of countries that have now updated their law, and we had the Marrakesh Treaty, it's possible to get this. We've had so many countries update their laws following the Marrakesh Treaty, improving the framework, giving greater certainty for libraries when they're providing access to information for people with disabilities. This is possible. We can change things. We can get an outcome here. Now, I've shared this once or twice in other meetings, and I can share a link to it, but this follows on from the idea that we have advocacy is a set of activities. It's a set of capacities, we're saying. Um, I promise I'm going to give you a shorter version of this, but fully encourage you, as I said, I'll share the link. Use this as a tool for working out where you are. So, for example, in each of the different aspects of what, what advocacy is, are you a starter, basic, intermediate, or advanced? I'll share this just because you know, I think we quite like it as a tool and hope it's useful for others. But given that we've only got a short time, we're going to focus on just four elements here. Um, 
So the first thing that you need to be able to do as part of your advocacy strategy in order to achieve those asks, as mentioned above, is work out who is in charge and how a decision is made. Because if you don't know who to talk to, that's obviously a problem. But crucially, even if you know who to, who, who to talk to, there may be processes, there may be meetings. It's not necessarily just by going to see the person who is officially responsible that you can change things. So you need to have that understanding. Where's the center of gravity? Officially and unofficially, sometimes unofficially that matters as well. We need to work out what information channels, how can we get hold of them? How can we create contacts, bring people on side? How can you potentially find champions who will work with you, for you, who can offer you insights and ideas on how to actually change that position? Don't forget also, it's not just the people who take the decisions, it's people, the people who influence the people who take the decisions that count. So are there legislators, are there parliamentary committees that could be talked to? Are there media, are there influencers who we know actually can have a say, who can actually really make a difference here? So that's one question. I will repeat the main questions at the end. Secondly, who are your allies and who are the opposition? Because clearly you've got the people, you've, we've, I've given you an ask, I've told you what that is, which is slightly dictatorial, but I've given you the ask, I've asked the question about who are you aiming at, but who can you work with? I don't know, which actors are there who share your priorities in the education, research, culture sectors and beyond? Are they engaged? Can you make them more engaged? What are they specifically able to do in order to support your work towards these goals? It's also valuable to think about who the opposition is. Where's there likely to be people who block things, either because they're scared of change, they realise that change may reduce the may reduce windfall profits, I don't know, or people who are just scared because they're uncertain about what's likely to happen. We certainly shouldn't underestimate that a lot of the time policy making around copyright, position taking around copyright is based more on fear than evidence. In order to do that, think about who's saying no, think about what they're saying, where they're saying it, because it's important, I don't know, politicians want to be able to feel that they're bringing people together, they don't want to feel like they're going to annoy people, they don't want to be criticised in public, so it's important to think about, well, can you avoid this, can you actually talk people down, can you counter the arguments, can you give the politicians good counter arguments. Third, how are you going to make a strong case? And this is really something that involves the whole field. And this comes back to Dick's point about your practice being so important. Because, OK, we need to work out what arguments are going to work. You look at the people to talk to. You analyse them. What are their interests? What are their priorities? What do they want to get out? Where do they come from? What's their experience in the past? Did they used to be a professor? In which case, they are likely to understand, are likely to understand the interests of research. Do they have children? In which case, they may have an interest in education and making sure that education works. And then it's a case of really using the field, making the most of the fact that we have this reach in order to gather stories and evidence and importantly do it in a way that appeals both to the head and the heart. So having numbers, having an idea of how many times it's not been possible to fulfill requests, that's important. How many projects have been cancelled because it's not been sure what's possible. But also obviously the heart, so individual stories of a student who wasn't able to complete their thesis the researcher who wasn't able to access the key text they needed. These are really important. And then also think about what tools are available. Are there, diff are there ways in? Are there, ways of, are, are there interesting ways of getting hold of influencers? Are there meetings? Are there fora that you can attend in order to make sure that you're in the same place as people? I don't know. Think through what are the tools that you need and what you may need from organisations like IFL or IFLA. Then the final one, is how you coordinate your work. And I think this is probably actually the structure you need to go for, is thinking about who's your team? How do you organize your team? What is the action plan roadmap that you're working to? How do you make sure that your roadmap works with deadlines? So as Teresa said, the next meeting of SCCR is in the week of the 13th of March of next year. And um, that means that we know that effectively member states will probably start paying attention to SCCR mid-February. They often don't sit from so far ahead. So how can you plan advocacy that starts with probably more gentle, higher level contacts, getting people familiar with you now, but then meaning that by the time we get to mid-February, you can go in with some harder messages, some more concrete messages. So that's the final, that's the final of the question. So in summary, this is another page that you might want to screenshot, is 
who's in charge and how decisions made, who are your allies, who's the opposition, how are you going to make a strong case for the ask set out earlier, and how you're going to coordinate your work. So I think that in the breakout sessions, which I know that we'll explain shortly, those are the key points that we want to, there we go, um, those are the key points that I think should be covered. Um, yep. Uh, th th those are the key points that, 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 that it would be good to cover in order to have the basis of your advocacy plan. I think I'm done on the substance there. I'm conscious that I might hand over to, is Damilare? Damilare is here, as we're going to explain how we're going to do the breakout groups, because at the moment we're in webinar format. Unfortunately, Zoom webinar format does not allow breakout groups. However, we have set up a meeting, and so we'll be sharing a link so you can go over there. So I don't know if Damilare wants to talk. Sure. Th thank you so much for that, uh, Stephen. So uh, colleagues, we're going to go to a new Zoom link now, where we're going to go to the breakout rooms. And uh, the breakout rooms have been structured into regions. OK, we have East Africa, we have West Africa, we have South Southern Africa, and also Central Africa. So you'll go to the breakout to this to the new Zoom link, and from there uh, you'll be assigned. You will join uh, the breakout room that's peculiar to your region, where uh, you will now plan with those in your region to develop an, a plan to engage in WIPO in your country. Focus on regional context now. Now you can work together, and afterwards uh, you we come back and present after the breakout room the plan you've come up with that will be presented by your leader. And after you get a comment from the speakers to review the plan you've developed, and after they go to the next steps, that'll be handled by Dr. Ayanda. That's so I, I can see the link to the new session has been dropped in the chat box. You just click on that link and join the new some link that we've sent to you. Thank you, Damilari. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm going to go to the link that I you have understood. Your link is your geographic. Uh, area L click onto that and go into the invitation and then uh, we are going to be working together as a team uh, addressing those questions and then we come back we do a presentation so that at the end of the, the webinar we have a product to say this is what we engaged in. I can see Stephen is already throwing in the, um, the links. Uh, any question on the mode that we are now going to be flying at? My dear beautiful participants, are uh, you okay with the arrangement? Do you understand? I Teresa, I see your hand up. So thank you very much. So I have a, a, a question. So um, what would be the best way for us to, to participate in the rest of the session? So for example, perhaps if you can let us know when you're coming back to the plenary session, and then we can perhaps rejoin then. And one of the reasons I'm asking is because Dick and I have another meeting like at this time now, and maybe we can divide ourselves up and, and sort of jump into that meeting and then jump back to your meeting when you're presenting your comments. That might be a good way because I'm, I'm interested and, you know, in, in learning what the discussions might have been about. And I think it could be, you know, if we can be of any assistance or help, we're glad to do that. Um, Larry, at the discussion will take 15 to 20 minutes. Yes, yeah, so it's going to take 20 minutes discussion. Uh, so you have enough time to plan and come out with a very cool draft for us. So 20 minutes maximum. 20 minutes maximum. So uh, and then be back uh, at about in 20 minutes from now? Yes, but, yeah. but use, use, use the link that's been put in the chat. I think we'll, 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 stay, in the, we'll stay in the breakout rooms. So okay. take, a copy, take a copy of that link. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, can we go to East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa? And just say, I, I, I will stay here and be in contact with Damilare to check that everyone makes it into the other room. So everyone can click on the link, move over to the other room, and I'll make sure that anyone who's still here in this webinar knows. And then you'll pose the questions in all the rooms? 
we yeah we 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 can do we can do that. I'll I'll send them across to Damalare so that he can then post them into the room. Okay, great. You're welcome back. As it appears, we're going to have a presentation from just two groups, that is East Africa and Southern Africa, because based on the participation, there was no one from West and Central Africa in this session. So I'm going to hand over to I beg your pardon. I'm from West Africa. Hello. <laughs> 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 Did you discuss alone, Vicky? <laughs> I joined East Africa, but I'm from West Africa. Uh, yes, of course, I'm also from West Africa, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start with Southern Africa to present uh, the outcomes and the plan. Uh, representative from Southern Africa can present and start now. So you can unmute your mic and speak. Who's presented was South Africa. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, they didn't say I should present. I was just their scribe, but <laughs> let me just now go on. Thank you, Nams. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on our um, breakout room, what we were discussing on, we were saying that, um, sorry about that, let me just click on. And please, you have just five minutes to present, please, five minutes. Thank you. Your time starts now. Okay. Um, when we were discussing on who is in charge, it was um, agreed that most of the time the laws of the land are the ones that are in charge, and these are made by parliamentarians or legislators, as well as uh, the right hold the rights holders of the of 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 the intellectual property. So those who are in charge, we are saying. Um, the laws of the land. And then we had an example of Lesotho and Botswana uh, in terms of those who usually make decisions or are in charge, which uh, one of our colleagues gave us an example of a company called SIPA as the stakeholder with other tertiary institutions and ministries, just like in Lesotho, uh, Ministry of Planning and um, other uh, ministries are also part of those who are who can be said are in decision making uh, in terms of our copyright issues. And then we were discussing on the roles of librarians in this decision making. Are we involved? And we agreed that we actually should be actively involved to what parliament has to decide, especially libraries, consortia, or associations. And then we said that our partners um, as professionals whom we should engage. We said we should engage the publishers whom we said they can be both our allies and opposition. Um, since at times they usually are opposing our, uh, they are usually expose, uh, uh, opposing extending exceptions to copyright uh, issues. Uh, and then we said our line ministries should also be our allies. Uh, we should engage those as well as the artists and the creators of the information, adding sellers of pirated intellectual properties. And then uh, how are we going to put in our case? Um, we said we could uh, actually engage um, uh, through our statistical evidence Hello? to support our case. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, and then we said that because we are keepers of the information, actually the information, uh, uh, the, the intellectual properties for research purposes and educational purposes, it means we should be the ones who are able to use that stand of us in society to push our case in terms of uh, convincing people out there about uh, copyright issues and advocacy. We were just about to finish when we were 
chucked out of our room, Damilare, and I hope what I have presented, I could get support from my colleagues. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Uh, you still have one minute left. If your colleagues wants to add in something, they can do that now. Okay, so it appears there are no comments or additions. So I just want to move on to the second group, which is the East African group. Over to East African group. East African group who is present on your behalf. You have five minutes. Okay, uh, who is representative from East Africa that will be presenting on your behalf? Okay, um, I can see a chat box from Purity, which I, I'm happy to read out on your behalf. It appears you're unable to speak. So East Africa was in charge. Uh, she mentioned cabinet secretary in charge of libraries, uh, parliamentarians, uh, in brackets, politicians, and and uh, what is PRVR is? Okay. And also, who are your highlights? Uh, publishers, learning institutions, opinion leaders, uh, national library associations, national libraries, and uh, copyright board, etc. And also, the next question, which is, how are you going to make a stronger case? Oh. Are you going to make a, a stronger case, uh, identify the real problem or a challenge on the ground and come with a strong slogan, e.g. books for all. Great, that's a very good one. And uh, secondly, the so coordination in line with internal policies and existing available laws of the region uh, in terms of creators and co copyright laws. So those are the responses uh, for the question as sent to us by Purity from the East African group. At this point, we're going to hand over to our speakers uh, to give comments on, on the plan that has been presented by the two regions that had a session. Uh, what are your comments on this and uh, what do you see as next steps? And also, what are your comments on how this can be improved on into actual steps uh, in these regions? Over to you. Uh, Teresa and Dick. Teresa, do you want to go first? Okay, Dick, thank you. I'll go first. Are, are you able to, to, to contribute, Dick, or are you on the move? I will be able to contribute, but I, I, I can't come on video at this point. Okay, all right. Okay. So, uh, so thanks very much to the to the presentations. I think there were some, you know, there were some really good ideas there and some interesting things. Um, I mean, I think uh, one of the questions, um, you know, as to who is in charge. Um, I think you're. You I mean you're right that there's different levels. So you've got like the, you've got the legislators and the parliamentarians, but also very important are the actual government policymakers. So the people in the copyright offices. So they are the, you know, the civil servants who, who often, um, you know, will draft the legislation, and they're the people who will, will, will be involved in the process of drafting a new law before it even gets to Parliament. So we need to be involved already at the very earliest stage before the law gets to Parliament, because sometimes when the law gets to Parliament, then, you know, it's already sometimes it's already too late or sometimes it's harder to make the change. So the sooner we can get into involved in the process, the better. And the best way is to know who the people are in charge of copyright in your copyright office. And in the earlier version or in the earlier webinar, I put a link into the chat for the WIPO directory of national IP offices. And in there you can see, uh, and it's pretty up to date, like it's a pretty good list. So you can see where does copyright fit in your 
in your government? Like, is it within the Ministry of Culture or is it within the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Enterprise or whatever? And then you can identify the person in charge. And then, you, you know, from there, then make, con make local contact with them and maybe find out who is actually in charge of the copyright office and get to know them, um, you know, organize to meet them, uh, uh, you know, and explain who you are, why you're a stakeholder and make sure if they have a mailing list for stakeholders that you, your organization, uh, your library association or the consortium is on that mailing list. So you are always informed about copyright, uh, any copyright consultations or any changes to the copyright um, law. The other thing that you, you can, another idea is to invite them to come to your conferences. So, so let them come, you know, and, and meet librarians and hear about library issues. And um, so that they can learn about your work and then you can also help to build relations with them. Um, then secondly, I heard that the, the word evidence and, and the need for evidence, I think that's really good as well. I think, uh, so we as the international organizations like IFLA and IFL, we can provide some of the global evidence and the statistics from the different WIPO studies on limitations and exceptions, and we can help to provide that information. I think what you can do, and it's very useful then, is if you can supplement that with case studies and with examples and actual real examples of you know, local libraries doing, doing um, supporting local research and local education. And that's always very powerful and persuasive to policymakers. Um, that they have, you know, local examples. So I think we can work together on that. And then in the in the the second group, which was from uh, included, uh, I heard mention of Lesotho and Botswana. So I can remember in, you know, as an example of where the library community has made a difference by engaging in the copyright process in those two countries. So in 2017. Eiffel organized uh, meetings, conferences in Lesotho and in Botswana, together with the local consortium. And some of you are on the call here who were part of that part of that uh, those meetings. So we organized a conference in Lesotho on the Marrakesh Treaty. And as a result, a direct result of that event, Lesotho ratified the Marrakesh Treaty. It was even mentioned in the speech by the minister at UNESCO General Assembly that as a result of this meeting in Sutu, uh, the government realized that the importance of this new treaty and they ratified the treaty. So that's a, like, that's a really concrete great result. Now we, we uh, are still waiting or the Sutu still needs to implement the Marrakesh Treaty into national law. And we're still you know, pushing for that and engaging with that, but that's a you know, concrete result. And then we also visited Botswana uh, and we had a meeting, the, the Copyright Office had a stakeholder consultation again on the Marrakesh Treaty, but the library community, the local consortium was there and making a uh, you know, very strong case for it. And although the law hasn't yet been updated, we understand that those, that they heard what we said and we understand that the suggestions that we made are in the draft law. So, uh, you know, it's, it's um, I think there are two concrete examples of where the library community has engaged and has been able to bring about some results. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, pause and see if anybody else wants to speak. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much for that, Teresa. So at this point, we're gonna hand over to Dick and after then, uh, Stephen will also give his comments on the plan that's been presented. Dick, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I apologize, I can't be on video at this point. Uh, I, I would like to, Yes, confirm that uh, most of the uh, approaches uh, suggested by my colleague, uh, Teresa, is exactly the way we want to engage policymakers. Um, but uh, in addition to that, uh, I think uh, uh, the Sub-Saharan uh, Division uh, can play an active role um, and probably be an important bridge between WIPO headquarters and other partners like IFO um, and Africa, or at least that part of Africa, in terms of uh, coordinating and engaging um, in, 
LIPO activities as well as in-country activities. Um, oftentimes, we know where policy changes are happening or legislative reforms are happening. I'll give you an example. Right now in Uganda, um, uh, they are actively consulting on um, making initial consultations and move, moving quickly towards um, um, amending the 2006 Copyright Act. Um, but there's been very little engagement uh, by um, uh, librarians and other beneficiaries, apart from rights holders and musicians and other uh, copyright rights holders. Uh, same uh, in Namibia, there we've been able to uh, mobilize uh, librarians as much as we could. And the South Africa, um, this has been ongoing. Um, it would be very useful if uh, the ASA and the others in the library community were actively involved. So um, I, I guess the, the key point here is for uh, the Sub-Saharan Sub African Division to uh, step up and the, uh, play an active role. I think it would be very useful for us to have uh, such a partner um, in to work with and coordinate. Uh, for instance, we'll start with uh, uh, collecting contact information of folks who have attended today's webinar and making sure that in all the countries, uh, were represented by the participants, uh, we have those individuals as the starting point. And going forward, those individuals could be folks that we um, work with to uh, bring to Geneva uh, as needed, or uh, folks that we can contact and work with for on in-country activities. So I think that would be a very important role that the division can play uh, in, in these efforts. Thank you. Great, thank you so much uh, for the comments. Uh, Dick Okoye, Kawoya. Uh, Steven, are you, are you still here? Great, so um, at this point, I think I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ayander uh, for well, action points and next steps has to progress. Dr. Yanda, over to you. Thank you very much, Domilary. Uh, we must have lost Stephen because the next question would have been, are we addressing uh, the key questions that he brought? And uh, it's very important that, uh, it's very impressive also that uh, in the different groups, uh, when we, 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 we got back, we found ourselves to be in line with um, what our key presenters, Dick and Teresa have given us, and they have given us examples, and they have also indicated how they can continue supporting us in our different advocacy group. So the beauty of this webinar is we come out of the webinar with some work in progress that we are going to do. I would urge also that in your different uh, countries, you, you, you try to work it out more in detail because here yeah, we're just talking broadly at regional level, but without uh, seeming to be uh, wrapping up the, the webinar, let me at this point hand over to um, uh, the chair so that she may wrap up. Uh, the chair would recognize our two great mentors for the support. Over to you, Madam Sarah. Sarah. Um, thank you so much, our dear moderator. Um, once again, a good day to those of you who joined us uh, halfway the session or the workshop. But nevertheless, we are happy to have you here. And to our facilitators, you've done a good job. And I'm sure uh, uh, we were about 70 participants on the call. But I think because of the engagement, uh, librarians shied away and they, they disappeared. But all the same, 
Uh, colleagues, my battery is running low. I might switch to another to device uh, shortly if that happens, but I'm around. So colleagues, um, I, I want to say thank you so much uh, for reminding librarians um, to raise engage. Uh, one thing I know about librarians, we are shy. We do quite a lot of things, but we don't want others to know about what we are doing. And then uh, somewhere we say, yes, that we do that, we do that. So I, I think in this workshop, we've been reminded uh, to always uh, speak out, to collaborate, to work with others, and then support, uh, play a supportive role in all that we do, and also keep our voices heard and be current. So without further ado, um, I want to say thank you once again uh, for making the time for this workshop. And thank you so much for the contributions uh, to our mentors. Uh, thank you so much for always supporting us. We are proud of you and keep the good job going. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Uh, at my workplace, my, my, my vice chancellor has the tendency of saying, I just felt I was talking to beautiful, beautiful people. I wouldn't mind you showing your beautiful faces because I know you are all beautiful. So we wouldn't mind if you can, you can just say bye bye to us by showing your face. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>